Greetings, fellow constant readers. You are listening to, or perhaps you're watching, The Company of the Mad, The Stand podcast. Today, we'll be discussing chapters 56 through 70 of Stephen King's epic novel, The Stand. And hear me now, if you've ever heard me before, there are massive, massive spoilers ahead. I mean, there always are, but this time, like, for real, like shit's getting real. Like it's, it's, people are, people are dropping off like flies. So if you have not read up to the end of chapter 70, I would highly, highly recommend that you put down the earbuds, close your phone, go pick up the book and finish these chapters and then return to me and my distinguished panel. To those of you who have caught up and are listening, you can let us know your thoughts on these chapters by using the hashtag the stand challenge on social media. And hey, don't forget, you can also watch the video of the podcast at thestandpodcast.com. Today, and as always, my distinguished panel is made up of some people I hardly deserve the chance to be in the company of, making me as merry as a schoolboy and as giddy as a drunken sailor. Mike Flanagan is with us, writer-director of such Stephen King adaptations as Gerald's Game and Dr. Sleep. You can watch his latest project, the series The Haunting of Bly Manor on Netflix. Tanana Reeve Dew is a novelist and the producer of Shudder's Horror Noir, A History of Black Horror. She also teaches Black Horror and Afrofuturism at UCLA, and you can take her online digital download course, The Sunken Place, by going to tananareevedew.com. Anthony Bresnikin is a novelist and journalist who has worked as a reporter for the Arizona Republic, the Associated Press, USA Today, Entertainment Weekly, he is the Los Angeles correspondent for Vanity Fair. I'm your host, Jason Seacrest. <laughs> I'm your host, Jason Seacrest. I write scary stuff and I write about scary stuff too. I'm an author of horror fiction and I write a column for Stephen King's limited edition publishers, Cemetery Dance Publications, called What I Learned from Stephen King, exploring the wisdom, life lessons, and spirituality in King's many works. You can hear me read those columns to you, read all my horror fiction, and get bonus podcast episodes where I ramble on for hours. When you subscribe at patreon.com slash Jason Seacrest, you can find a link to that and also to Tanana Reeve Dew's online course, all these things and more at thestandpodcast.com. We have a very, very special guest with us today. You might think that no one has been more steeped in the stand than four people who committed to reading the novel during the pandemic and doing a podcast discussing and dissecting it. You'd be wrong. Filmmaker Josh Boone, director of The Fault in Our Stars and The New Mutants, has been submerged in an analysis of the novel for more than five years. And this year, his vision of bringing the stand to a whole new generation on television has come to life. Writer, producer, director of the all new CBS all access series, The Stand. Josh Boone, welcome to our little asylum. Uh, it's happy to be here. Thank you guys for having me. I'm gonna start by asking you the same question that I ask everyone on this podcast. Although I have to say, I, it's not fair because I already know your answer to an extent because I've done some research on you, but you have a very, very unique story to tell here. How is it that you first came to love Stephen King? And when was your first time reading The Stand? Um, so yeah, I've, I've told this story many times. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna do it like I always do and just give it to you. And then you guys could ask me more specific questions, I guess. Uh, I was raised by uh, evangelical Christians, like born again Christians uh, in Virginia Beach, Virginia. And uh, Stephen King was sort of a no-no. So I was certainly drawn to his books because they were, uh, they were not allowed in a lot of ways. Uh, so I would often tear the covers off Christian books like Frank Peretti's This Present Darkness, which is about the size of uh, the plume Dark Tower books. And I would glue those to them. Uh, and I read The Stand under my bed. I, was, I guess I was 12 and it was summertime. Uh, and when my mom's go by, I would shove the book, the book up into the box springs above my head where I had cut a hole to put uh, contraband. And uh, 
they found my copy and they burned the hardcover of that in the fire. No, no, no. You know what? It was a, I had a hardcover of it with no cover. And I had the 78 paperback with the blue cover with the fade that has the bird in it and all that. Uh, and they burned those in our fireplace. So, uh, so that's, that's sort of the story of how I got, uh, I guess, uh, into Stephen King when I was young, a lot of it was uh, forbidden fruit. And a lot of it was just, uh, taking joy in somebody writing about young people at the time because there was no young adult books really in the way that there is now and I think a lot of kids my age read Stephen King books at the time uh and that was their young adult books really back then for them uh and you know I wrote him a letter when I was maybe 12 or 13 as well and sent him a, a couple books hoping he would sign them I had heard uh I had read somewhere maybe in a newsletter for like the Overlook Connection or something that uh he would sign a book if you sent it to him so uh I didn't have his address. I just knew that he lived in Bangor, Maine or, or had a house there or something. And I sent, uh, I sent this kind of box of books off into uh, oblivion, hoping that they would come back to me. And uh, I came home from school one day and my dad sort of grabbed me and pulled me aside and was like, there's a box here from Stephen King. I didn't tell your mom because she was uh, the, 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 the one who was a little more uh, evangelical about the books. Uh, she's a huge fan now, by the way, and watches every week and is, is much calmed down from then. But uh but yeah, he had sent me a beautiful uh, limited edition of one of his books that he signed and wrote me uh, a really nice letter in reply to mine. And years later, I put him in my first movie as, in, as himself and like a cameo uh, in my first movie, Stuck in Love, where Nat Wolf plays a uh, kind of like a young me, I guess, in some ways, who's obsessed with Stephen King and wants to be a writer. And uh, he kind of gives him a phone call at the end that, that helps to set him on his way, I guess which was really my nod to mall rats where, where Brody gets to meet Stan Lee. <laughs> <laughs> now, I'm personally fascinated by this because I'm a huge believer that King's stories are some of the most spiritual that I've ever read. They read to me like Aesop's fables, always providing wisdom and life lessons to be learned. Mm -hmm. you, grew, you grew up in such a religious household. And yet, as you, as you once told your mother, as she was burning the sand, I think I heard you say to her, that you said to her, yeah. The Stand is the most Christian book I've ever yeah. read. Also, yeah. if I could interrupt for a second, very hard to burn something this yeah. day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Not an easy it's book not to easy. burn. Not easy. <laughs> Do you still feel that The Stand is the, one of the most Christian books that you've ever read? I mean, I'd say, I'd say in terms of the, the King books I've read, that and Desperation are certainly the most biblical uh, and have the most to say about the Bible's teachings, I, I think, for me. And I did grow up in a household where, you know, since I was a little kid, I believed Jesus was the son of God, that the devil was real, that demons were real. That was what I was immersed in and brought up in. Um, I've, so heard you also, say, I've heard you say that on a, lot of, on a lot of different interviews, but I've never heard anybody ask you what you believe today. Is that something that you still believe in today or is it? No, I mean, you know, I'm certainly not a, a, a Christian in that sense. Uh, you know, and I, I went to become an atheist really for about a decade where I was so kind of over... Uh, everything that I had had shoved down my throat when I was a kid, that it took me uh, some time for the pendulum to swing back. But I'm much more uh, open and spiritual now than I was, I guess, in my 20s, where I was sort of coming out of the church and all that. Uh, so my mom and I could certainly talk today, and uh, we might use different words for what we would uh, be describing, but we'd be talking about similar energy. That's amazing. That's great. Now, of course, The Stand has always been a journey from beginning to end, but nonlinear storytelling is something that dates back to other such epics as the Odyssey and the Iliad. Mm -hmm. It's a very interesting choice. Was that your decision to tell the journey in a nonlinear way this time around? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, the way that I got this job at Warner Brothers was I pitched them a non, they had it to do a movie of, which was a crazy thing. But I was such a big fan. I was like, I'm gonna try like, I don't care. I'll, I'll do something crazy. I really thought if we shattered King's structure, that it would uh, allow you to tell the story in a more fluid way and cut through a bunch of stuff in order to, to make it a movie or a two part movie or something like that. I was trying to pitch them on the golden age of Warner Brothers like JFK where I was like, it's three hours. It comes out on Christmas Day. It's Matthew McConaughey. It's it's Christian Bale. It's all these people. So you know, I was I was preaching it as hard as I could, but they were like, "We're not spending that much money on this." Uh, and really, I didn't want to make a set piece based uh, uh, film for them, and they really wanted it to be a little less character driven and a little more driven by uh, set pieces that would need to be sort of engineered into the narrative. So eventually, we were able to get this over to CBS. Uh, 
nobody believed it would happen. My agents, my lawyer told me there was no way it was going to happen because of the lean against it was uh, a lot. Uh, but I had accumulated such a cast of uh, actors for it. Uh, Whoopi had been with me since Warner Brothers, Amber Heard, Greg Kinnear, Nat Wolf, uh, all these people that I had kind of developed relationships with. So I was able to go to CVS and bring them a really large cast that I think took a lot of the edge off perhaps uh, the monetary investment, uh, which was substantial and they spent a lot of money on the show. Uh, so, you know, and I was able to bring also the hope that Stephen King was gonna write this last episode for us. It was something that I had been nagging him about uh, and continued to nag him about, uh, uh, you know, for a couple of years after until we were able to get that done. So uh, I kind of did that and helped them develop it for television and brought in, uh, my producing partners, Nate and Jill, uh, Nate, who I've known since, you know, we were little kids in Virginia and uh, brought Owen King in, who I had worked with on a Clive Barker project that we had uh, written a draft of uh, in CBS, you know, brought us some cool TV people to meet and we met Ben Cavill and he was awesome and brought him in to do the show running beyond uh, the episodes that I sort of was focusing on really like a feature film. Uh, we shot one and nine back to back because they both needed a, a real cornfield in them. So it sort of dovetailed nicely. So I was able to shoot those right up front. It is such a, you know, that writer's room has such an incredible list of writers that's in it. And it, but it's also- We were in it for a year. I mean, we were in that room for a year kind of developing the show and everything. So, wow, you know, by the time we even went to shoot it, it would probably be getting close to five years then for me. So I was pretty- I was pretty worn out when I was done with my episodes. I'm sure that you must have been. It's also though, I mean, it was so your baby because I remember, I remember there being a tweet that you had sent out forever ago or an Instagram or something that was basically the hardback novel with a hundred color coded post-it notes that were inside of it. And that and it was, was really, to, you know, that was really Jill has been on that with me. Jill, who's on, uh, who's a producer on the stand uh, and has worked with us for many years, uh, worked with Nate many times. You know, she and I broke the book down for when we did the Warner Brothers draft and I went and wrote that. Uh, and, you know, the draft even then always opened with the church doors opening, Harold on the body crew, all that. That was sort of my favorite stuff in the book uh, and framed everything morally for me. But she really helped me break that book down and organize that book and know where everything was at any given time. So uh, all those color coding was really her doing that while we worked on all of it. And wow. all of our books at some point end up looking like that. It's amazing though, when you have something that's really your passion project, that's something that you've been wanting to do and have been thinking about since you were a child, to then suddenly have so many people involved in the creative process. Is it something that now that, you, now that it's done and that you've seen all the episodes and it's a unit, do you feel as though when you look at it that it is what you envisioned it to, to as always what you wanted it to be? Or did you feel that somewhere along the line that maybe that vision was compromised or anything like that? No, I mean, you know, for, for better or worse, it's like we really did develop it nonlinear. Uh, and it does eventually become one thing as you get a little bit further along. But uh, I just saw no reason to go make Mick Garris's stand again. I mean, that was one of kind of the iconic, you know, things that I watched in the 90s growing up as a kid. I taped it the night that it came on and I watched it many times after. Uh, I just think you're in real danger of something that was the most viewed miniseries of all time when it came out. And, you know, it's like keeping yourself interested too, where I've read it so many times since I was a kid and I know it so well that it was also all of us as longtime readers trying to make it fresh and new for ourselves where even if you'd read the book you would never know quite where we were going to go uh and could perhaps have as interesting of an experience as someone who hadn't read the book yet uh was the hope speaking of having read the book or not read the book how many of the cast members did you find had just read the book from start to finish? Like, was it, was it most of them ended up reading the source material or? Well, it's, it's, I mean, you know, Amber is one of the most voracious readers of science fiction that I know. And she was a big King fan and had read The Stand years before. I mean, really I was editing Fault in Our Stars when she told me she had to be Nadine. So, I mean, she's been on board for years. Uh, Whoopi had wanted to play this role when Mick was casting it uh, and wasn't able to, there was a, a scheduling conflict or something like that. So. You know, she was uh, already a diehard Stephen King fan. I, Mike, do you remember in the 80s, I, I remember her doing a big fat blurb for It, 
and maybe it wasn't on the book, but it was on, it was used kind of heavily in the press. So she was kind of blurbing for him even at 85 uh, and was a really big fan. So uh, I tend to gravitate and go towards people who are also fans. Uh, you know, Nat Wolf read the book through me, Henry Zaga read the book through me, uh, just through talking about it on other movies that I made and through meeting actresses like Odessa, uh, I knew prior to this. Uh, it was just kind of arranging the people the same way I did with my other films. Uh, you either write them for specific actors or you kind of have somebody in your head that's your ideal. Uh, that helps you kind of envision it as you write and create, uh, gives you sort of a, uh, a foundation for the character. And sometimes you get who you want. Sometimes you can't afford them and you go try to find someone who has a similar feel, but uh, it's always kind of chasing after that. But we were able to get really a lot of the people uh, that we wanted, which was, uh, was an incredible thing. There were so many actors and so many deals that had to be done and schedules. And uh, it looked like Mission Impossible from kind of every way you looked at it. Boy, I tell you, I, I've only seen the first episode so far, but, but Owen Teague gives an absolutely Amazing. powerhouse performance as yeah. Harold Lauder. I mean, just, it, it really, that performance really blew me away. I just thought that it was a really, really great characterization of that. It reminded me so much actually of Charlie Decker from Rage. Yep. And it made me yep. realize how much of Charlie Decker is in Harold Lauder and how I felt like he was bringing all those layers to life. He, he's, he's an incredible actor. He really is, you know, Ben and I made a really conscious decision and Jill and I had even talked about this even long before because when it was a Warner Brothers movie, Nat Wolf was going to play Harold. He was much closer to the right age then and when uh, he grew up as this thing, you know, made its rounds and did what it was going to do, he ended up being Lloyd. But uh, I never wanted him to be overweight like he was in the book. I do feel like there's sometimes a crutch in King novels and it works better on the page than it would on screen where it's like, Sometimes people are defined a little bit through disabilities that they have and things like that, which is a brilliant way to shine light on characters like that who never get a chance to in fiction. But it's like with Harold, I didn't want it to ever feel like she was rejecting him because he was fat or because he was repellent in the way he looked. I really wanted it to be what was inside him that was repelling her uh, so that it never felt like she was... Uh, not thoughtful in her choices or something, I, I guess, is how we thought about it. Wow. Well, that's a very interesting choice. I, I want to I get to the, the chapters that we are dissecting in this particular sure. episode. But before that, I have to ask one more thing. One of the other really interesting choices that you made that I had to ask you about, in the, in the final scene of episode one with Campion, you made the choice to have Randall Flagg's boot be what's holding the door open that allows Campion to get out and allows this virus to sort of be unleashed upon the world. And I had to ask because you are a spiritual person and you did grow up in that kind of household. I had to wonder if that was your way of saying that even when horrible things happen, that we want to blame an individual or an established like the government for, is it your way of sort of saying that there's always greater forces at play? Well, I mean, it is a departure from the book because we put a let him be a little bit more involved in the unleashing of it, which again is like uh, the, the shot I'm probably proudest of is the shot in the back seat at the end that, that has the, you know, him go by as a hitchhiker and end up in the back seat. We had done, uh, I did an animated storyboard of that. And, you know, getting him, uh, the stuff with Campion was really cool. It's like, I mean, the question's such a hard question because it's like, you know, there's evil that's from, things that happen to people when they're kids and you know cycles of things that recur in families but there's also something else that it always feels like is out there uh in a good force as well I, I wouldn't maybe call it god but maybe i'd call it the divine field or i'd call it uh a light that loves us or something like that it's like i think there's good as well as evil and i think uh it does work through people positive and negative energy whatever that is that's about as vague and spiritual as I could, as I could get about it. But, you know, for, for us, it was also getting flag into the story earlier, making sure that he had a really powerful, you know, uh, appearance in that first episode that really kind of sold him to audiences and got across, you know, the lonely boots walking on the, on the clock and along at night, which was sort of the stuff I remembered the most vividly uh, about him was just that lonely, I don't know, that lonely sound of those boots going. We talked a lot about those chapters um, when, uh, earlier this year. And um, 
in coming to these chapters and talking about uh, going through to the end of uh, chapter 70, I have, to, I have to start by saying that I was wrong, gang. I was so, so very wrong. And I'm happy to report that I was. A couple of episodes back, I noted that in a world where one in every 10 Americans is gay, it is fascinating to see that the only remote hint of homosexuality in the stand is represented by the kids' sort of homophobia and gay slurs. And I suggested that perhaps it was his own repressed urges, which then results in um, a forced attack on the trash can man. I'm delighted to say that this is not the only depiction mm -hmm. of anything other than heteronorms in the sand. In these pages, we find, um, we discover that Dana Jurgens is bisexual. And what a badass bisexual she turns out to be, in my estimation. I mean, in these chapters, this chunk of like 200 pages, it belongs to Dana Jurgens, who's really like one of the unsung heroes of the stand. She not only risks life and limb to spy on the Vegas camp, but in the confrontation with the evil dude himself, she kind of refuses to allow herself to be an informant. Um, so much so that she's willing to take her own life in this grotesque way, um, just to make sure that he doesn't glamour the hell out of her. What an incredible character and what a fantastic way to, to move the story forward. Were there any thoughts um, on Dana as one of the great heroes of The Stand? Anthony? Yeah, I think she's, she's not one that you mention a lot uh, or you hear mentioned, uh, partly because it's a book packed with like 30 amazing characters, but yeah. she gets her part, you know? I think it's like a true, uh, it's a true spy story. You could you could take that a similar story and put it in World War II or yep. uh, any of the great conflicts uh, of the past where you embed a secret agent to watch and report back and be a scout. And you know, what's the, what's the, uh, I guess the trope or I don't know what, what it is in real life, but the, uh, uh, that notion of the suicide pill, right? You'll be given this uh, uh, thing. That's the tenant pill. Yeah. <laughs> the bite if uh if to get yourself out of the situation but then yeah. you know it's, it's the ultimate sacrifice right it's not a sacrifice on a battlefield but uh in a way it is it, maybe it saves lives on the battlefield if you can get close and get some information and i was what all... a terrible assignment too oh yeah, yeah terrible yeah <laughs> i mean gotta yeah, go gotta that. gotta go sleep with lloyd a lot <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a nauseating assignment and yeah. she she managed to pull it off what an actress first of all let's give her props for being a great actress but that standoff um is so notable because it's almost as if he it's like in the wizard of oz right and we see the dark man as sort of the man behind the curtain i mean he's so frightening in so many of his manifestations when we're away from vegas through the crows through the wolves, I, I, but when she's face to face with this guy, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't know what to do with her, you know? She's just, like you said, Jason, she's really this force to be reckoned with. And it's so interesting how that seed of doubt kind of ripples throughout Vegas. It's like, well, that didn't go the way he wanted it to. So what else is messed up about this guy? Maybe we're, maybe we're in the wrong camp. <laughs> <laughs> I, I always imagined flag a little bit like a balloon that gets inflated over the course of it. And each of these people who comes in punches a hole in it over the last act of it, you know, and each thing makes them deflate a little bit more and become less and less powerful. Yeah. 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 I loved, I loved, I absolutely loved Dana. And, you know, I was even, I was also reminded of um, Adrian Mellon, from it, you know, the, the gay characters in King's book are written with such compassion and such empathy, but more than this, they're so important to the story. I mean, they might die as a lot of characters in horror novels often do, but they go with such nobility and they go to teach us something really about the horrific nature of the bad guys. So kudos to King for that. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree more with you guys. And I, I think she's an incredible character that also starts to really illustrate something that I found very striking on this read of it, um, which is just how completely the stand of the title doesn't refer to a single event, um, but really kind of refers to this collective effort because all these different characters have their piece of it. And, and kind of like what Josh is saying, I think, 
so beautifully about poking the holes, you know, in, in the size of, of what kind of society flag is, is intent on making. You know, I, I think it's really neat that we start to realize in these chapters that we're already kind of in the stand, that, that the promise of the title yes. is already being fulfilled and that it's gonna be a while before we see the conclusion of, of that event, but that no one person in the story is gonna be capable of standing up to and defeating Randall Flack, right? It's only the collective effort that gets it done. And I'd argue that Dana comes the closest of anyone in a one-on-one -on -one confrontation to like essentially kind of kicking his ass, you know, um, not, not in a physical way, um, but it's the first time you see Flag really respond to defeat and acknowledge that it could happen to him, the shock that he seems to display, you know, that, that first crack that lets him know he's not, not going to be invulnerable uh, to these people, that that's where you see it happen. And I think as you look at the various stands other people take, I, I think there's something really special about hers. And the scene is just, you know, electric. It's it's such an incredible scene to read, um, and I, I can't wait to I can't wait to see how it's realized in in the incredible. I think Dana is I think Dana is well represented, which is good. We we also agreed she was an important character and an important gay character. Josh and Mike, is this your first time ever meeting? Have you ever been in the same? We've, we've talked via email before, but we've never met before. Yeah, I like, I and, like and actually, <laughs> and and likewise, and, and it's funny. They, can I tell them how how we ended up uh, so talking sure. via email? No. Uh, we 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 started emailing because um, I went on to eBay to buy um, a limited edition uh, of Revival, beautiful beautiful set of Revival, and uh, Josh was selling it. I was a seller, and I. I wrote the, I, I wrote I the introduction it, and yeah. they sent me a couple copies. <laughs> <laughs> and and he, he emailed me on eBay first uh, when the transaction was done. It was just like, uh, <laughs> hi. And it was, oh my God. And so we, we, we got to go back and forth about Revival, you know, being a project that Josh was doing first. Mm -hmm. um, and then I ended up also not doing Revival. Um, so, uh, it's been a really, you know, we have that in common and I think we both, we both gone through the ringer on that particular I, story. I had to, to amazing right. talent, uh, interested in doing it, but I found it to be far too expensive that I was able to generate and do justice to King's book without having to really, really change everything, which I didn't want to do. Uh, I stepped on the exact same landmine and ended up in the exact same place. But I had I, Samuel I, Jackson wanted to play Jacobs. I couldn't have thought of a, a cooler like, way to go. And it's like, it was like, we can give you this much. And it's like, I need like 25 million more dollars than that. Huh? <laughs> oh, I feel wow. your pain so acutely right now. Um, and I mean, you guys had storyboarded probably most of the movie and like, you know, it's had a lot of precasting and stuff. It just was not enough. Well, I, I would love to trade. Uh, we should we should get together someday and trade scars, boards and scars. drafts and scars <laughs> and, and everything. Uh, and I, I, I kind of hit the same walls with it where it was just so expensive and um, man, did I love it though. And I, I treasure the beauty uh, of that book. book. The beauty of that book comes from how long of a time period it takes place over. And to do that with two actors is a, is a huge challenge. The Irishman couldn't do it. And I love that movie, but I still don't think, well, you know, when they're under the hood and you meet them the first time and Joe Pesci calls De Niro kid, you know yeah. that you're like, oh, I want it. They could maybe they can go back and fix this later. <laughs> I love the movie so much. I'm thinking the two of you need your own podcast. Is what I'm. Thinking. <laughs> could That'd just be fun. Yeah, I could just listen to the two of you go on forever. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, and and I I would bump into Josh over the years when I would talk to um when I would talk to Rand, who's uh, mm -hmm. Steve's agent. Um, about you know what was available and what wasn't, and and I would come in and be like, I'm really interested in this, and be like, Oh, Josh has that, and like, Josh. <laughs> um, so you know there was always a, there was always that. Um, but uh, but no, I, I I'm so thrilled to actually be face to digital face with you uh, here because we we've had some wonderful wonderful correspondence, but it's always it's always wonderful to to meet like this. And and I couldn't think yeah. of a more exciting guest for this podcast right now as 
as your miniseries is, is is unleashed upon the world. I'm excited um, for people so exciting. to see. Uh, excited for them to see the last one, especially the. I mean, I, I love all of it, but the the coda was special because it was. I got to do an original script that he wrote. Uh, I still remember the day that he sent it to me, and it was like. I mean, you know, it was like the most exciting day of my life <laughs> that I had this original story he had written that was a stand story that nobody else had uh, read it was a uh, you know, strange feeling to the little kid from the past. Oh, that's awesome. I, I can't wait. And I, you know, we share a couple, we, we share some people, you know, I, I had Hamish Linklater oh, uh, so starring in, in my show right after he came off of the stand. And, and so I got to completely corner him and be like, tell me everything. We had, <laughs> we had great fun. And, and, <laughs> He, he said that he, he loved working with you. He had a great time. And, and beyond that, he was like, I'm not telling you a damn thing. I was like, damn it, Hamish. Uh, and him, so then him, I just him and, him. Him, and uh, him and, you know, and James sort of had the bromance in the first episode. Uh, so it's, it was nice to see them work together. And they were, uh, Hamish was just so good. He came in and was just like, I was like, dude, this guy is great. <laughs> He's a nah. fiercely talented actor. Yeah. Nah. And I, I, I can't wait to, to, to see how you guys work together and, I'm I'm dying to watch it. I I would have uh, I really wanted to have watched it before uh, before today, but I've just been you you were really making stuff. Underwater, you're, so, you're, yeah. I can barely watch my I can barely watch dailies when I'm making stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just want to jump in and say I've only seen the first episode myself, but it feels like such a family affair. All of us here love King so much. Have had different um interactions with king and that little love letter to cemetery dance by the way i don't know if everybody caught it but harold yeah. lauder got his rejection yep. from cemetery say dance. Hi to, say hi to rich chismar and brian freeman they're great guys i've been buying stuff from them for you know for 20 years 25 years uh so yeah i wanted to get them in and that was that was even scripted uh uh, to to get a little nod to them in there, so Rich could brag, <laughs> and 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 helping to contribute to the uh, the ruin <laughs> of the personality <laughs> of Harold Lauder. <laughs> I don't know if anybody else has seen this far into the series, but King's cameo, which I won't spoil, is also pretty merciless. <laughs> I think that was. I feel like that was either Owen or Ben's idea in the writing room to put him where they put him, and I thought it was brilliant. It's a new, wow. uh, it's a new, it's a new take on yep. that away. <laughs> so, oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. I'm so excited to see that. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Steve loves that kind of thing. I think he likes, he has a good sense of humor about himself. Absolutely. Well, before we move on from Dana, I just wanted to read a section here that um, it's where she's been caught and is about to be brought to flag. And I have to say, I know <laughs> Not our Eve is going to back me up on this and she's going to have plenty to say about this. Um, almost so much that I'm, I'm sorry that I'm bringing it up first because I, she tweeted about it before I did. But um, I have to say that um, I was reading this section and I was reading these chapters on the morning of election day. And the, it just suddenly struck me like the divisiveness of Vegas and Boulder where America has literally become no more than two camps felt so eerily familiar to me in a way that just hours later as a presidential race that shouldn't have been too close to call probably more and more started to show that America really was 50 50 and our, yeah. our, our, all of our talk about a nation divided was suddenly solidified as no longer being questionable. So as, so I'm reading this and Dana's being taken to flag and Jenny says to her, do you think it's nice to come over here and spy on folks? You deserve everything you're going to get. And sister, you're going to get a lot. Sounds like Twitter, right? So Dana turns, <laughs> Dana turns and looks at Jenny and says, what do you think they're doing here? Why do you think they're learning to fly those jets out at Indian Springs, those strike missiles? Do you think they're so flag can win his girl a Cupid doll at the county fair? <laughs> Jenny pressed her lips tightly together. That's none of my business. Will it be none of your business if they use the jets to fly over the Rockies next spring and the missiles to wipe out everyone living there? I hope they do. It's us or you people. That's what he says. And I believe him. They believed Hitler too, but you don't believe him. You're just scared gutless of him. You don't believe him, you're just scared gutless of him. So I'm, I'm reading this on the morning of election day 
and tears just start streaming down my face thinking about how this conversation that the two of them are having is not unlike conversations that will be being had all over the nation at family dinner tables on Thanksgiving and on Christmas. And by the way, that's for those of us who still have families to go back to that haven't been completely torn apart and ravaged by the divisiveness of our culture. So the parallels of what a post-apocalyptic fantasy novel called The Stand is depicting and what is going on in the year 2020 just continue to astound me. Preach on it. Jason, and to, and to dovetail with that, since you mentioned my Twitter, uh, you also tweeted that the biggest gains uh, for the Democrats were or in, in, were in Boulder, right? And, mm-hmm. and there were huge gains for Trump in Las Vegas. <laughs> so it the parallels c- continued. And that whole notion, and I won't be on my soapbox too long about this, but oh, man, it, it is so... <laughs> Take your time. It Thank is so God. horrifying. He's, and... he's taking his time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure, right? Just the nature of fear as a motivator in Vegas also struck me a great wow. deal. I'm not just from sort of the GOP politicians who are terrified of standing up to Trump because all Trump has to do is make one tweet and I'm going to ruin you politically. We're seeing with these local election boards that all of the publicity has brought death threats, you know, the Georgia Secretary of State and, you know, all this now being turned on them, you know, being turned inside the the family, so to speak, in the GOP. And fear has driven so much of the popularity of our soon-to-be ex-president, thank goodness, uh, that us or them feeling. Every time I hear people talk about tough on crime, that's just sort of a dog whistle for us versus them. Us and right? them. Like us and them. The wall is all us versus them. They've got, we got to get them. We got to lock them up before they, they get us. Or, or just this, it's so caveman. You know, it's so, it feels so primitive in so many ways, but it's, it's really old faithful uh, in, in U.S. politics long before our, the current resident um, in the White House. And King does nail that. And we talked about this a little bit in the last podcast. It really feels like the people who are in Vegas should, should be sociopaths and serial killers, but they're not. They're just regular people who have let themselves be overdriven by fear. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, just reading that, those chapters, you see, you, you see that, I don't know if it was Dana or somebody's actually, somebody's there and they're talking to people and she realizes what, what you're saying, that, you know, that in, in, in Vegas, in Flag's camp, that a lot of them just seem to be normal, everyday people. It's really something. It's, <laughs> they're not great. They have, they have intelligence. They're, have, you know, they're just scared. Well, it's, and it's like, too, it's like you get some bad people in Boulder, but they're sort of complicated, like real people are. Like Nadine, I think, is one of the most complicated characters in The Stand. And, uh, you know, Larry Underwood, you know for some of that book really rides that line where he could go either way uh so you have to sort of imagine that everybody's journey was like that to some degree or another occasionally we get like the kid or a trash can man or something like that but i would imagine yeah for the most part it's uh it's uh it's people like the people in boulder but a little bit i don't know a little bit different (laughs) Yeah. We're, we're so divided. We, we are so divided that, you know, I've never brought this up on the show before, but just, you know, I've also never, <laughs> I've never asked anyone, it's interesting, usually on a podcast, they ask their listeners to go review them and to leave a five star thing or to subscribe or something like that. Like, we don't usually do that on this show. But you know, I'm going to ask you, if you're enjoying the show, please go leave a review on Apple Podcasts or whatever the podcast is that you're listening to or YouTube or whatever the case may be, because I noticed that we, we've actually gotten, we've gotten one-star reviews for this podcast, and the comments that come with it are saying um, that they refuse to listen to it because it's liberal rhetoric. And that oh, we, I, and, and one person said, one hard, person, I'm so heartbroken to hear that, but that's terrible. <laughs> well, one, one person said, one person said, and this was, this is like after episode two, they said that, that they couldn't listen to episode two because they were using it. They said they're using it as a, as a liberal platform to bash the president. And I thought that's because 
is that not because I mean King is so outspoken and vocal that he's associated with? Maybe, uh, maybe I'd I was like, we morals, never even, right? we never even said that. We never even. I was like, we never. When I read that, when I read that, I was like, we never even said anything negative about the president in episode. I thought, two. I, thought I, I thought. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say I've got something for those people right here. <laughs> I've been dying to talk about for a while, and I tweeted this a couple of years ago. And uh, she, you guys know the writer Sarah Kenzier. She's written a lot about uh, Trump and uh, and authoritarianism, and she's a big fan of the Stand as well. And she shared this after I shared it. And this is Harold's goodbye letter, which we're gonna get to later in this yep. section of the book. And he's got a line, and Steve agrees with this. He and I talked about this when I interviewed him in the spring about the stand, that uh, the people who align behind Donald Trump uh, are just like the people who align behind Flag in Vegas, where once they get out of that spell, they're all going to go, oh, yeah, I didn't, really, I didn't really want that. I just sort of went with it, or I didn't know. The I didn't know is the part that I think King foresaw what is it, 40-some years ago. And when Harold writes his suicide letter, he says, I am sorry. This is a poor excuse for my actions, but I swear out of all that I know that it is the only excuse that ever matters. I was misled. And I think that's what people are going to say once we're out of this haze. Like, oh, yeah, I guess, but I was misled. That's why I supported him. I was misled. I or they'll deny that you supported it. So put that in your one-star review there, MAGA friends. <laughs> <laughs> I did find like his, uh, I find his, um, his letter to be one of the most moving parts of the book because he signs it Hawk, which is, you know, the yeah. stuff that I have in my episode was the stuff that I had always had in the Warner Brothers drafts as well was like the moment where he saves that guy's life and his boss says, good eye, Hawk. And like for a moment, he's there sort of, he could go either way. I knew I wanted to use all that text from King's book and try to bring it to life because it was, for me, the most powerful stuff uh, in the book, you know, uh, that speaks for every character in the book to some degree or another. And on the reverse of this, you know, we talk a lot about Trump followers and their behavior, but I think on the left, too, sometimes we can be unwelcoming of people who are maybe ready to come over, you know? Yep. One of the things, I, uh, I moderated a Comic-Con panel with your cast, uh, for the Stan miniseries. And I think it was Whoopi who said, Nadine, nobody embraces her. Even Mother Abigail like puts the stiff arm out and doesn't want her around. And if somebody had just welcomed her in and maybe- Loved, was a little loved her. her. Yeah, and somebody had just- That yeah. bit with Locke is that's when Harold starts to turn is when he feels like I'm accepted, I belong. And I'm not saying they weren't right to have their guards up, but like, you know, maybe sometimes people who are on the edge can be pushed uh, in one direction or another. Sometimes they can be brought in and sometimes they can't. And you got to know yep. when to put those people out the airlock. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I was kind of moved by his, his, his letter at the very end. You know, Steve lets us feel a little bit of sympathy for the devil. Oh, my gosh. Are you kidding? I mean, it's it had me in tears. I mean, you go from hating this character so much to all of a sudden realizing that there's a little bit of Harold in all of us and there, but for the grace of God, go I. I mean, yep. when he writes, when he writes, I could have been something in Boulder. I mean, I, I just, I lost it. I just totally lost it. And I couldn't help but completely feel for him in those pages, um, which is what King does so brilliantly Absolutely. all the time. I mean, he always takes us down this path and has us feeling a certain way about someone. And then he goes, P.S. Humanity. <laughs> it's like, we're all human. We all have light. We all have dark. We all, it's like, he's, he's so good. He's so good at that. And um, I think we're going to end each of these discussions by saying, can't wait to see how you do that in the miniseries. <laughs> 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 yeah, well, I mean, I'd say like the the the. I mean, I'm I'm really happy with that first one. Uh, in terms of me personally, uh, the, all the Herald stuff, I felt like I got what I wanted and got, was able to get. I was able to get it the way I saw it in my head from the book. Nice. Yeah, I have to say, and I to talk about Harold, and he is such a, a complex character and a sympathetic character in, in the end. Um, I did like the way he was introduced in the miniseries. I mean, there's one point where uh, he 
sort of is sidling up to Franny. You know, she, I, I won't get too much into the plot for people who haven't seen it yet. And, and you could see he's sort of making his moves, but tentatively, and he's still very shy. And I said, oh, that jerk. And, and my husband gave me a look like, what did he do? And it's like, well, it's not what he's done here. <laughs> he's not being a jerk right now. It's just, I know, I know how he turned <laughs> out. <laughs> you know? I mean, as, as a matter of fact, he was being kind of sweet in the moment. So there really wasn't anything to complain about. And that, that, that's true of Harold. Um, yeah. And, and, and also, uh, who's your face? I, I'm so bad with character names. Uh, Franny. Fran, no, Flags. Uh, Nadine. Uh, Betrothed. Oh. You know, uh, Nadine. Nadine. Nadine also, you talked about how it felt like she could have gone either way. And that's, that's part of the, the brilliance of the, the story. And, you know, we talked a lot about her as being someone, because you meet her in the book so young, we really did feel like she needed to be somebody who was groomed by flag, basically, from a very young age and had been almost like a survivor of, uh, a, you know, of, of him preying on her, basically, since she was a kid and trying to worm his way into her future, uh, mm. which makes, which is why, I don't know, I have lots of feelings about her because her backstory is so complicated. Well, what's that saying? Hurt people hurt people, right? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I, that's, that's another one. And I, as I said, there's, there's a lot of spoilers in this episode. So again, if, if you're not up to where we are, stop and come back. But we, and that doesn't just go for the, the book that goes for the miniseries too. But we've, listen, we just got a lot of characters dying in these pages and King sends them all out so beautifully and with such poetry and talking about, you know, Nadine, it's like, I love how Dana kind of creates what quite literally um, an, an open window <laughs> for Nadine to, to do the same. And Nadine, I mean, she really gets under Flag's skin there in these final moments before throwing herself off of this, you know, high window and taking the child with her. And um, it's another, it's another one of the many, in these 200 pages, there's just a ton of, of characters that go, but it's another really, it's another really memorable one. That's for sure. Yeah. She, she sort of shines a spotlight on the limits of his power, which is infuriating to him. Yeah, yeah. And one of the big, one of the big um, death scenes, of course, obviously, is the devastating death of Nick Andros. And I don't know, this is such a sidebar, but by the way, I don't know if you noticed this. King uses, I'm, I'm sure you've all noticed it, King uses time codes to build tension. And it's something that he's done ever since Carrie. Like, he'll end a chapter or a section with, it was 2.23 p.m. <laughs> like, and I, I always thought that this should have been a dead giveaway when it came to his pseudonym, Richard Bachman. Because Richard Bachman is, by the way, a very different writer than Stephen King. He's, um, he's more cynical. He's darker. He's actually, I find him to be funnier than Stephen King at times. He has a very dark sense of humor um, that can be downright hysterical. But one of the things that they have in common are these timestamps at the end of chapters and sections as a way of building this sense of dread and tension. So as we're going back and forth between um, where Harold is and where Nick is and sort of earlier in the day and later in the day, there's this, it was 228, it was 625. It was, you know, this whole sort of thing. So I don't know if anybody noticed that or not, but it's a, it's a great way of building tension in those scenes that I liked. It's just King, it's just King all over. Yeah, the, the ratcheting up to that explosion is certainly, you know, the vivid, vivid memories of reading that when I was young, uh, specifically that, you know, those beats. And, and you know, it, it, is, it is absolutely devastating, his death, and obviously is going to be and, and devastating to, to Tom, I'm sure. And, you know, something that um, Mike's wife, um, Kate Siegel, said um, on the show has continued to resonate with me. Um, she compared the book to the work of Steinbeck and said that, um, you know, it's one of the great American novels, obviously, in her opinion. And there's this, been this nagging thing in the back of my head that keeps saying it is like Steinbeck. It is like Steinbeck. It is like Steinbeck. And I was like, it's like in more ways than one, in more ways than one. And I was like, how is it like, how is it like, and I suddenly realized in these chapters that the relationship between Tom and Nick is almost an homage to Lenny and George straight absolutely. out of, of Mice and Men. Yep. It took yeah, me a minute absolutely. to get to that. You sure. know, their friendship is certainly one of the most beautiful uh, 
I don't know, one of the most beautiful friendships in the book out of a book that has a lot of great friendships, but that one in particular, and it's denouement, like how the way it all resolves later in the next episode of this podcast, uh, uh, do some of the most beautiful stuff that'll really make you cry when you read it. Wow. Wow. Um, and then of course there's also, I mean, there's the death of, uh, mother Abigail, uh, which is just heartbreaking to read about. And she of course tells them all at last, um, which is interesting. She tells them all at last, but we were told first in the miniseries um, that they must go to Vegas and um, that with God's help that they will stand. Um, and I can't help but picture Whoopi Goldberg um, saying this. And you, you, I, you know, you know, it's so funny. She's, um, she's the only person I ever imagined for it ever since those movie scripts. And it's like, I didn't have any experience with her on, on talk shows because I'd never seen her show or I just never saw it. Like, I just loved Color Purple, loved Sister Act, loved Ghost, like thought about how great she was in those. And I was like, why isn't she in movies anymore? Uh, so we just, I went to her as, as soon as we had it and just was like, come on. She's, I think she's one of the great actresses, really, truly. Uh, and one of the great comedians. I, we thought she I would can't wait to see that we thought we she would keep her grounded in a way that she can be a little bit not grounded in the book and a little bit arch in terms of just how biblical she is and we felt like Whoopi would keep her real uh and let us know if it wasn't feeling right uh and all that you know we kind of let her drive that once once we had her in yeah I don't know how you addressed it in the the miniseries I'm still on on episode one as I said but the return of mother Abigail is actually a very difficult read for me, you know, because she is so diminished from being out in the wilderness. She's, she shouldn't be alive. So she's almost just supernaturally alive. And, and I don't know how she's going to look on screen, but on the page, she's just cadaverous. It's like just, you know, like this horrific shell of a person who, who now her only purpose really is just to impart information to these people right whereas before when she was you know killing the chickens and cooking biscuits and stuff and 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 remembering her life she was she was more of a of a of an, of an actual character and by now by the time she she comes back she's literally a shell of that character and it was it was just difficult <laughs> I, I hate to go back to politics i don't want to be the guy, only guy doing that but uh Hey, I brought it up this time. It's the, I brought it up this time. So. Oh, yeah. And just wait till the next episode because I got so much to say. <laughs> <Vegas>. oh, <God. laughs> yeah, wait, get ready for some more one star reviews. Uh, <laughs> listen, I don't care, but, but I will ask people who, you know, we, I've, I've never done it before. So, hey, if you're liking the podcast, go review <laughs> us and give us five stars. God, I've never said it before. Reading Mother Abigail's final, you know, time on earth made me think of Ruth Bader Ginsburg in a way. Oh. You know, this old, frail person who we were all like, you know, stay with us, stay, uh, who gets almost to the end of the journey, but not like a lot of prophets, doesn't finish the actual journey yeah. most of the way, and then you have to go the rest. And uh, it kind of, uh, I think that's the power of his books and why they've endured so much and never gone out of print once is that they can apply to so much because he's a very empathetic writer and he thinks about universal themes. I think 50 years from now, somebody will go, oh yes, this scene reminds me of this thing that happened just a few months ago. <laughs> and like, you can draw parallels uh, and between the, uh, uh, the different instances of real life and, and the fictional one. Yeah, and I'd, I'd also say that there's been no other writer who's had such a far-reaching impact on popular culture. Like, I'd say incalculable how much. Um, yeah, I mean, I think he's the, the greatest living author without any doubt. Boy, I, you're not going to get any, any, um, any argument out of me on that, that's for sure. Mike, what were you going to say? I, I, no, I'm still just re recovering from the Ruth Bader Ginsburg connection I, I i had not made that connection and and when i when you said that it just kind of knocked the knocked the wind out of me um that's that's, that's a profound connection to make uh wow um and i and i think you know I, 
that sequence, that kind of final, final conversation that they have with her um, resonates with me for a couple of reasons. You know, one, one being that I, I very much love how defiant Franny is um, once the plan is kind of laid out. It's not like they take it in and reverently hear it and nod and the the solemn weight of, of their responsibility, you know, hushes them. Franny's like, fuck this, no. And um, I think articulates really beautifully a, a lot of, of how a reasonable human being, a very good reasonable human being, um, has to respond to that kind of responsibility just to, you know, just to play their part in what is a difficult struggle between mankind's better nature and mankind's darker nature. And, and I, I just loved how succinctly not only was her objection stated, but that Mother Abigail's response to things was tough, you know, and it's like, what do you mean you, you, you can't see, you know, which one of them will fall along the way? It's like, sorry, I can't see that. You know, also, I don't know everything. Is, um, isn't it also the, you know, it's, it's, it's not wanting to believe that there's a destiny for your life that you can't get out of that God's called you to do. Uh, I guess that yeah. sort of feeling too, just like that your life is not yours to control. Absolutely. And, and I that think is, yeah. as I can continue to kind of run it through, uh, through Anthony's point about Ruth Bader Ginsburg, which is really devastating me right now, Anthony, I got to mm -hmm. tell you. Um, as I continue to kind of run it through that and, and look at, you know, not only how we uh, ascribe kind of messianic um, properties um, to, to leaders and to political figures and to celebrities and things like that, how we imbue them with, you know, an almost supernatural and, and kind of Christ-like power, you know, um, to, to reveal them to be just as mortal and, you know, just as unlikely sometimes to finish the fight that they took up so enthusiastically, you know, and to hand it off to people who are like, I don't know what to do with this. Yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't know how to carry this forward. I, 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 I find that to be pretty profound as well. So yeah, we need yeah. heroes, we need leaders. It's just, they need us to do the heavy lifting. No one person can do it alone. So you've got- Yeah, I mean, that that's, goes right back to the TV series even. It's like, it took so many people to make the show. It's like, I got it to a certain point and I had a bunch of people who had to help me get it the rest of the way and write a bunch of other episodes and other directors and all that uh, monumental task. Just like when you think about, I don't know, just all the characters in the book that contribute to ousting flag at the end, you know, and getting things started over in the right direction. No man can do it alone. That no. is for sure. <laughs> it takes a village. Um, Mick, except Mick Garris, he could do it alone. <laughs> he did. <laughs> So sure. funny. <laughs> Listen, these these two hundred chapters were were really they were uh, I I felt that they were um, some of the hardest to read so far for me just because we've come to know and love these characters as though they are our own friends and family over the course of um, twenty twenty and uh, to have so many deaths in such a condensed period of pages uh it it did just kind of gut me reading it um did anyone else have that sort of feeling before we sign there, off on these chapters there's uh, so much so and, and i think there's something else that that struck me reading it this time which is that even though we love these characters and king clearly loved them he's almost uniformly dedicated to describing their demise in a really graphic way uh, kind of each, it's not enough that Nick blows up. They have to look down and be like, there's an arm. And it's not enough that the judge is shot. They have to be like, yeah, there's nothing but teeth left. Like um, when Dana <laughs> gets it in the window, they're, they're so specific. It's, he, I think what, what qualifies it as horror is not just the death of these characters that you love, but to reduce them to meat and, and to really be explicit in the, in the way you know, if the body is the temple in the way that the temples are desecrated, like how complete the sacrifice is, um, it, is, it is prepares, really striking. It prepares you for an ending where you lose most everybody else too. 
you know, in a lot of ways, it sets you up to know that like he will kill them and watch out. Well, this, and so it's hopefully, also th- hopefully they die to doing something that's that makes them worth you know the journey that they had as characters. Sorry, whole, sorry, I interrupted. No, you. that's okay. I, I was jumping in early, but the whole idea of, of of your role in in being chosen as a spy or an ambassador or making that journey and to die in ways that can feel needless you know like why does nick have to get blown up other there were other people who didn't get blown up (laughs) why did he have to get blown up why why does the judge why did the judge go if he's just going to be shot unceremoniously um on the road and it's only in in retrospect you can sort of see better how every everybody especially with dana everybody plays a role we're 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 chipping away at the image flag's image we're chipping away at his stranglehold over those Uh, those people's personalities but it it, it's also very sad at at the time to feel like it's a, a needless death it feels like too it's like you needed flag to be at his highest level of power so you'd be really scared for tom since he's the spy that you're the most worried about so uh one in everybody's heads is a good way to is a good way to good way to make you worry it's that's like, a good point it's like d-day you know there are going to be people who storm the beach who don't make it so that they'll make it past the surf line so that you can make it a little bit further so that people behind you can make it a little bit further it's yeah like, it's like, it reminds me a little of, uh, have you guys ever seen that speech by the uh, 1960s era activist Mario Savia, where he was like, sometimes the operation of the machine becomes so odorous, makes you, uh, makes you so sick at heart that you can't do anything but lay yourself on the gears and the levers and you've got to make it stop. And I think that's what these characters do. And the judge, you know, it might seem a little like, you know, extraneous, but he goes into that maw and in, in the, uh, in the miniseries that, judge is uh, a woman recast as a woman and uh so she goes into that maw and she helps you know she alerts the reader at least that these guys they're going on this journey and they may not even make it halfway there you know it ups the stakes in a big way um you're not just slipping in and you're gonna do your spying and get out it's tough even just to get there and the the uh, man, uh, Randall Flagg is, he's watching and knows who's coming. I, I, I like also, I guess my favorite thing about the book was always that Stu fell and broke his leg and Larry had to go because he was the one who needed to go the most to heal his character, uh, to be to be ready, you know. It's like, uh, you're like, oh my God, Larry's gotta go, we're, we're fucked. But it's like, uh, he's the one who had to- Yes. Yeah. And I- yeah. That goes back to my uh, first reading of the stand too. And we're a little bit ahead of the chapters because I checked, yeah. but you said we could speak ahead, Jason. So I'm going to jump ahead. That moment where uh, Stu gets left behind, I just broke down in sobs as a teenager reading this for the first time because, of course, it was misdirection. I mean, I would have broken down in sobs either way had I known yeah. what was going to happen to the ones who went on. But just again, the pointlessness of it, it was going well. The walk was going well, and everybody else made it. <laughs> Why did he fall? He, you know, well, he, but he, he fell so he could take care of Franny's baby and be the father to her child. That's what right. God needed him to do. And uh, he needed Larry to take this, the stage he never got in real life. Uh, too late, too late, stage, Larry. All right. He's got to go, go get on stage again and do what uh, the different version of what he would have hoped to be his big hit single is uh, a little different in Vegas. <laughs> Wow. wow. There's a lot, I, find, I find it to have a lot of ironies and character ironies and God having a sense of humor. And also, I, I don't know, if you're king. I mean, he's the God of the story. So, you know. But these are all things he struggles with, too. You know, you look at Larry, and the whole, his whole motivation is that woman he had the one night stand with saying, you ain't a nice guy. He thinks, tells himself he's a nice guy, but he sees her, he hears her, and he thinks, Maybe she's right. I wasn't nice to her. I wasn't and nice then when he sees, when he wakes up and sees Rita's body, he really doesn't think he's a nice guy. You know, I feel, I feel like that she's so critical the way, you know, in the book, because when he wakes up and she's dead, it's like, that almost makes it true, you know, and in some ways, cause you know, he was terrible to her too. Uh, uh, it only gets better over the course of it and through the community in Boulder and everything. But, uh, 
yeah, man. And it's like King, uh, he, he certainly is one of the great authors who can uh, describe the perils of drug addicts and things like that, having lived through so many things, you know, so much of that. Well, Jack Torrance, you know, is his whole fear of, am I going to be a terrible father? Am I going to hurt my kid? Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, I think he's well aware with a lot, so many of his characters of the destruction they can do, the destruction they can almost do. And it's all about that push and pull. Like, how can I, can I avoid becoming my worst? And he, I think he's somebody who tries. In, as no, a, yeah. He's so self-aware. He's so self-aware and so aware of um, all of the different gears and levers that exist within humanity. And it's, uh, you're right. I feel like he's, um, I think that he writes about the things that scare him the most. And I think that he, uh, it's almost like a form of therapy for yeah. him. I mean, I know I've heard people say that Tabitha has said before, um, that she doesn't like, it, it, she doesn't know what he would do if he couldn't just get to paper and pen. Like it's just, it's just a, it's a constant need to just to write. It's a, it's a really, and, and other writers are not like that, you know, and uh, that's the thing, that's something about writing that you all know. I mean, writing is um, so different for every person. Um, so different. Everybody has their own way of, of doing things, but um, for him, it's almost, uh, it's almost manic. It's almost, um, I, I feel like when I, I recently read, um, right before I read The Stand uh, this year, I read uh, The Dark Half, and I felt like a lot of the way that he, it, it felt like a prequel to On Writing in many ways. It felt like the way that he was talking about the process of writing for Thad Beaumont was I thought that's about the closest that I've heard Kim talk about what writing is like for him. So I'd say, I'd say misery too is probably, oh. I read that to my daughter this year. We've done like a, she's nine, but I do a little light editing, but not too much. <laughs> but we, read, we read the Institute. We read the new, you know, the new collection of novellas. We're reading just oh. the childhood sections of it now. Oh. Uh, but we, we read that we read misery and dude, it's one of the most powerful I mean, that book is about writing, I think, almost more than anything else. I'm sure it's about drug addiction, too, and things like that. But it's like just the description of Paul kind of escaping into the hole in the paper to to escape all the misery that Annie's brought on him and all the drug addiction problems he has. Uh, it was, to, to me, maybe even more telling than Dark Calf, although I love that one as well. It's a lot of fun. Uh, I can't I can't wait to, to, to read um to read misery to, to my children when they're nine. It's I so can't good. wait. <laughs> oh dude, she's, she loves it. She's, she lives with me. So she's, she's, uh, she knows. <laughs> oh, that's, that's the reason why we, we have to, Justin, we have to get children. We have to have children soon. <laughs> to corrupt them. <laughs> yes. I mean, it's wonderful. Just, that's all the fun right there. We just, I try, we try to, I try to be very open with books and things like that because it was not oh i wonder so why I, young, I wonder so, why uh, yeah. i'm a little more open about that stuff and uh if you can read it and figure it out good good for you <laughs> it's amazing mike tanana reeve anthony and josh thank you so much for joining me next month we'll be discussing chapters 71 through the end of the novel and you know i just have to take this moment too because we're at the end of <laughs> We're at the end of 2020. Thank God. Oh God. <laughs> but I mean, I will we'll be, you know, the next time that we'll be, you know, we're going to be talking about the, the rest of the book, um, really. And the end of the book is uh, at the beginning of um, 2021. And I just have to say, it's, it's been such a highlight of my year to be able to read this book with with you guys and to just i i know that years and years from now you know when i look back on when my, when my children ask you know what what did you do in 2020 what did you do during the pandemic it's like i wore a mask i stayed home and i read the stand with a group of really really cool people like i'd i'd add just one thing and i'd say uh I, the, the thing that I'm most happiest about the limited series of The Stand is a lot more people will read it again or read it for the first time. I mean, to me, that's almost, it's like doing anything like this is to keep the license on that book as long as it can continue being read, in my opinion, uh, is the most important thing about it. 
Very cool. Very cool. Of course, as always, you can get notified of when new episodes go live by subscribing at thestandpodcast.com. You'll also find links on thestandpodcast.com to bonus podcast episodes, to Nana Reeve Do's online course, Anthony Bresnikan's articles on the stand, and many, many, many more wonderful things. Um, and as we close today's episode, the stand podcast always asks you to take a stand. Listen, whether it's to the EMS FDNY Help Fund, which you can find links to donate to on thestandpodcast.com or to the charity of your choice, the Red, Car- the Red Cross, whatever it is, please find a way. This is the season of giving. Please find a way to make your stand on the side of the good and donate whatever you can to help those who are suffering from COVID-19 in the middle of this pandemic because there is still suffering and it's not over and people are still getting sick. And, you know, there, a lot of those people are people who put their lives at risk every day to save others. So um, go to the standpodcast.com, scroll down, make a donation today if you can, or donate to the charity of your choice. And until next time, remember that the place where you make your stand doesn't matter, only that you do and that you're still on your feet.